Hello, and welcome back to another episode of If My Feet Could Talk. The episodes where we talk to guests about everything and anything to do with running sports, mental health, and other subjects along the way. Uh, thank you for those who are returning uh, to the episode, and welcome to any new listeners and viewers that, that I have. So it's been a funny few weeks recently, hasn't it? Uh, we're still trying to deal around the world with the outfall of coronavirus. However, races are coming back. I'm getting to see friends uh, finishing races, slightly different formats, but it's, they're happening and it's nice to see these finish line pictures once more. It's also been pretty good the last few months for FKTs, fastest known times. We've had some pretty epic ones over the last few months with the likes of John Kelly, Damon Hall, Beth Pascal, Joe Meek, um, amongst them all, smashing some of these long last, lasting uh, records that have been out there. And that brings me on to my next guest. I've known him for a few years now. And we've become pretty good friends. I love him a bit. He's always shown me support for the, for the things I do. And I believe he is pretty much our best UK ultra runner if not one of the best in the world. He's up there amongst them. He's achieved things that leaves us all in awe. His feet have definitely had some adventures. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mr. Dan Lawson. <laughs> Okay, and we are recording. Hello, mate. How are you doing? How's the family? Yeah, I'm good, man. And uh, yeah, the family's very good. Yeah, yeah. We're all, um, all, all dealing with the uh, the corona, all right? You've been keeping yourself well. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the way we deal with that is try not to listen to too much of the news because it it scares you a little bit. Just just to actually take a look about what's happening around like outside like like in our community and everything seems fine yeah so um yeah so we're dealing with it quite well yeah it's okay that's that's the main thing obviously thank you for coming on on my show it's uh it's really much appreciated I, and and as i said prior to recording you're much sorted off sought after man for obvious reasons um and we'll go into that further on but first of all i want you mate to to let our viewers and our listeners know a bit about yourself, where you're from, um, your family, what your makeup is, um, all that sort what of thing. Makeup is L'Oreal, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I like the bit of mascara, man mascara, yeah, yeah. So, where you from, mate? Um, tell us about a bit about your family and what you do. Where am I from, guys? It's a good question. Uh, yeah, I'm from like what, like years and years ago. Like, yeah, when, was... when you where did you first pop out? I'm, I actually was born in, in Norwich, um, like in Norfolk, but um, yeah, I didn't, I wasn't there for long, like I, it was never, I think I left Norfolk like before I was like a few months old or something, then I grew up in uh, like, like the edge of Suffolk, kind of Suffolk, Essex border, and um yeah, but then didn't hang around there too much. Um, beautiful, beautiful part of the world, but there's not much going on. So, uh, and then ended up in like where I am now, kind of like Brighton. I've been, I've, I've been in Brighton for like, I don't know, a good 
good 25 years maybe so I suppose I consider myself from Brighton now but I but I'm probably yeah like technically I'm not am I you're from the southeast originally no I'm from Norfolk originally you <laughs> 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 should be talking like that but, <laughs> um you obviously you've yes. got kids you've got kids yeah, I've got two kids and one, uh, like, kind of grown-up kids now, like, 20 and almost 17 next week, uh, Ruby 17, and then one, uh, yeah, one grandchild as well, the the apple of my eye, the light of my life, yeah, little little Lumen, yeah, so. What's, what's, it, what's it like being a granddad? It's the best thing absolutely ever, yeah, it's wonderful, it really and, is. Yeah. And how old are you, Dan? Just so our listeners and viewers know. Uh, forty-seven. Forty-seven. So you're what, five five years older than me. So you're still a, a young pup. Yeah, rub, it, rub it in, mate. Yeah. <laughs> you're still a young pup, you know. Because <laughs> obviously, when people th- hear "oh, your granddad," they naturally assume you're like really old. Yeah, I am quite old. Don't you? <laughs> you're not. You're not. But well, I am a granddad. There's no that is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what, what were you like growing up though Dan as a child were you a sporty kid did you get involved in team sports and stuff like that uh yeah like yeah I, I was like um yeah sport would played a big part in my life my uh particularly my my old man was quite good he, he would always like get us watching sport take us to watch it get us involved and um yeah, I ran, I played a lot of football when I was younger and I ran uh, a bit when I was younger, but football was really like what I preferred to do. And um, yeah, played a bit of cricket, you know, a little bit of golf. Like I just, yeah, played played quite a lot of sports. Went to watch a lot of sport. Like I was, like I'm a, I'm a West Ham fan and and yeah i spent a lot of time watching west um and how, getting... how, how did that how did that happen because then you're from norwich and then yeah my old man's from uh uh like brentwood upminster oh, right, yeah. yeah so it's his fault yeah it's his <laughs> fault. I, but maybe it's this this like being a west ham fan is quite good it's um i don't know it's a bit like ultra running isn't it there's a lot there's a lot of bad dark patches and every now and then a little bit of a high and then back into the dark patches. So I'm a uh, I'm a I'm a Cardiff fan, so I'm full of dark patches. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good for you. It's good to be a, a supporter of a rubbish team. Yeah, really. definitely. Um, so obviously you you as you as you grew up, you mentioned you dabbled in a bit of running, but when did you first start finding the love for actual Stretching those two legs out. No, yeah, I ran like um, I think like around like eleven or twelve. I was running quite a lot. I was running like five k's, ten k's. I think I even did like a half marathon at like twelve or thirteen. Um, and it was like uh, I I I don't know if I I. I I don't know if I loved running then. I was just all right. I was just quite good at it, so I could go somewhere and, like, as a young lad, and like win a medal and a trophy, which was always quite nice. So, um, yeah. So I, I ran. Yeah, I did run, but then I stopped running and kind of played football for years and years and years. And I think in my like thirties, maybe like late thirties, I got back into running again after playing football for years. And I think. That's when I really started to to love it because I realised that there was so much more to it than just uh, like a, just a physical exercise. You know, it's a whole like I understood holistically how it kind of it it, it you know it calms your mind. It um, it gets you to a like a clear space. It gets you out in nature and as well like physically you feel good from it. So I think I really fell in love with it in my kind of late thirties. Yeah. So when did you first do your first sort of long distance race marathon or what have you? Yeah, it was always a dream of mine, like when I was younger to run the London marathon. And um, 
or wanted to do. I think you had to be. I think you have to be back then. You need to be eighteen to run it, or maybe sixteen. And um, I, I never got round to doing it when I was sixteen or eighteen because other things got in the way. First of all, football, and then just being like a teenager. Being a lad. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like um, many other things on my mind. I'm not running <laughs> still that far from the um, forefront of my mind, but. Um, I always remembered that dream a little bit and um, when I got back into running in my late 30s it was like right I, I really need to run a marathon so it was one of the first things I did was just go out I didn't enter a like a race or anything I just went up into the South Downs and just ran like 26 miles and just to see what it was like and it was um yeah, it was quite hard, I did it? It was quite hard. I remember the last few miles I was running along Brighton Seafront and it was, uh, it was, it was, yeah, it was tough. But yeah, I did it and I suppose since then, yeah, I've just, I suppose that just gradually increased the mileage. And got so to how, how did you feel when you, when you completed that run over the South Downs for 26 miles? What? Obviously, it was hard. You said it was hard, but how did you actually feel at the end of it? Can you remember? Yeah, it wasn't. There wasn't any. It wasn't like an elation or like a oh my god, this is amazing. It was just I don't know. It was just um, it was more like I was just interested to see how I felt. I've been playing football for so long, so it was a different type of. And you, I don't know, it was just interesting to see how I felt after it. But it wasn't a massive em, emotion. It wasn't like a life-changing yeah. moment that got me into running. It was just well, something I decided to do on a Sunday morning. So, I don't, I don't know, it wasn't, yeah. But it obviously, it, it, it obviously changed your, it did change your life to, to a certain degree because that's what you decided to settle down on. Yeah, I think... Um, I don't think that particular thing changed my life. I think the fact that I just just realizing like how uh, it's well, not even a realization, but just seeing how good running was for me. You know what I mean, it was just it's just a beautiful pastime, isn't it? I think, and just it was so. It wasn't about running long distances. It was just about going out and running each day, and just like just enjoying that that headspace and that stillness and you know I was doing I was meditating quite a lot around the time when I like started running again and just finding that running kind of got you to that space like it it was like you're rather than sitting down and like calming your mind down and spending time watching your breath you could go for a run and it would almost be like you were that shot out of a rocket and you were you got straight to that kind of place of calmness in your in your mind so I think that was it wasn't the achievement of running long distances it was the feeling of stillness in my mind it was more of a life-changing thing for me yeah um so you've got one of the biggest running CVs I've ever read on the internet your 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 so running career Adam, has Adam Tango Holland's got a good one. Looks well, like he, he he does, but he's got a big one. Yours yeah. doesn't. You're you're not just you varied. It, it's you know you've you've got road, you've got trail, you've got multi day, you've got timed events, you've got everything. And I'm just going to go through a few here for our listeners and. Um, and what have you? Um, if I, we haven't got all time to go through everything, um, in 2015 you came um, first place with the Great British team at the Turin World Championship, 24-hour World Championships. Uh, you won the Grand Union can, uh, Canal Race that year as well with a course record. Uh, Spartathlon that year you came second place. Uh, as we go up, Bad Water in 2016 you came third. I remember tracking that. Uh, Bad Water, for those that don't know, is 135 miles through Death Valley. Uh, your shoes melt to the tarmac. It's stupidly hot. Um, you then came first place at the 24-hour uh, European Championships for Great Britain. 
we, we move on. You obviously went again at uh, the World Championships in Belfast, but you got injured during it at 230 kilometers. Uh, you won the Ultra Battle On course record, uh, the 24 hour International Marathon Festival at Solchow. Uh, <laughs> well, we, we, we can go on. Obviously, you recently ran the Jordan Trail and got the fastest known time with Robbie Britton. Uh, nine days, 10 hours and 17 minutes. How long was that? Uh, not that long. <laughs> More of a holiday, that, I tell you. Um, it was about 650k, maybe. Very, very tricky terrain and not much of a trail. So we spent half the time off the trail trying to find it again. And uh, actually, I'd be lying if I said I spent half the time navigating because Robbie did it with navigating. <laughs> You did. Uh, you came first place during the Emu six-day ultra marathon, uh, 920 kilometers, a new British six-day record. Um, Road records. Don't give me the. Uh, yeah, I've still got to beat. Road I'd like, record. Yeah. So the track record's a thousand kilometers. Yeah. It's, uh, I'd like to be able one day to break that thousand kilometers on a six-day. Yeah. So that's just a small snippet of some of the stuff you've done and some of your, your obviously your podiums your records and so forth over the last five years alone just there um and if anyone wants to go a look at it go on his website we'll give you the i'll drop the links in later and what have you and you, you can all check it out it's really impressive but what does it feel like when someone reads that back how does that to hear your achievements over the last few years since you've taking running back up how does that go in your mind of what you've achieved well when you read it back it's just a nice I just have some nice memories on some of them actually it's quite nice I don't know I always feel like it's not I don't know I don't feel like there maybe at the time I feel like I've achieved something but once the race is gone it's kind of just it's just happened I'm just I suppose I'm, I just yeah, there's not, I don't, the achievements, it's more like this, this nice memories, like when you mentioned the, the Sochow race, I think about like, uh, that meeting, I don't know, other runners there, you know, and, and, and having fun with some of the runners, and the, when you mentioned the Balaton, I just remember how sunny it was, and, the, you know, having fun with Charlotte when she was crewing me, so it's more... Yeah, I don't know. It's not the achievements, it's more the memories. You know, I've been really lucky that I've managed to go and I've just been allowed and just to go and run in some beautiful places around the world in, in some amazing races and, and, and met so many wonderful people as well. So it's just... Um, yeah, I mean, you, you've obviously, as I mentioned, you represented uh, Great Britain at the various World Championships and European Championships and stuff. What was it like when you first earned that Great British Vest? It's got to be something, because not many people get to get to wear it. Yeah, that was, it was not, it was really nice. That, yeah, that felt, I suppose, a bit like a sense of achievement, because I've, like I said, I spent a lot of my youth, like, watching sports, and, like, a lot of memories I've got from when I'm younger, like, watching the Olympics, and, you know, like, things like Daley Thompson, that whistle in the national anthem, and that, that sort of stuff, like, so that did feel really nice, yeah, um, to to wear the kind of GB, um, like colours or whatever, or vests. Yeah. And But, I mean, yeah, but like the GB stuff is just, it's it's so amazing as well because it gives you an opportunity, like as, as an ultra runner, you're just like so much of your, you have your crew and, and that, but so much of the sport is quite, it's quite solitary and yeah. it's, it's quite lonely. You know, your training's quite lonely. Um, and, and yeah, when you're running the races, it is, it's quite solitary. You're kind of just doing it for yourself. Do you know what I mean? And, and when you're at, when I've been running for the GB team, oh, it's amazing. Like all of a sudden you're part of, like it's like I'm playing football again. You're part of a team and you yeah. really are like working. Although we're there as, running as individuals as well like our main priority is to try and uh, medal for the team and it's just uh, 
it's beautiful. I, I, I really like that. That kind of su surpasses uh, like representing your country now, like just being there with that fantastic team of other athletes. It must have been, it must have been good as well competing against some of the greatest ultra runners we have in the world. You know, like Camille and what have you on the track. You're on the same track as these guys, and it's not something you often do, is it? Yeah, I and mean, the 24 hour like format is wonderful because you're. Yeah, if I was running against like Camille, you know, Courtney, like um, some like Alexandra Zorokin and the, like Little Ivan, the Spanish uh, runner, like if you were running in a race against them, you wouldn't really, you wouldn't see them, you know. You'd either be well, hopefully you might be in front of them. <laughs> they might be in front of you, like, and you, there'd be like ten, fifteen minutes like between you all. So. Um, and the 24 hour format like allows you to like kind of chat and, and run run with people for a little bit, but then like not run with them, but then see them as they're coming past and chat to them as they're coming past. So it's real, yeah, it's a real, it's re it's really nice like that. And and like, as you know, like we're so lucky in ultra running, like you just don't meet a you just don't meet an idiot in ultra running. Everyone's just so like beautiful you know like such lovely lovely people so it is yeah it's like one big i don't know what you call it like a when you go to those world championships it's like a it's like a summer camp or i don't know like festival it's, yeah it is a festival and all all people from all around the world that you've become friends with and you've met them in like other races other than the like the world or european championships and you get to see them again and Everyone eats in the, in the the same big halls like Hogwarts like that, yeah. And so you you can sit with the other teams and chat with them, and it, it really is, a, yeah, it really is a lovely experience. Yeah. Do you get do you get to party with them afterwards after the race or? No, not. I mean, the best one is um, no, not in the Europeans or the or the worlds. It, everyone kind of everyone's kind of too tired and then everyone goes home. The best one's Spartathlon, isn't it? Yeah. Spartathlon's brilliant. You finish a race and then they have like a kind of like afternoon party somewhere and then another party and then like the full on party in Athens when it's brilliant. Like everyone turns up to the, to the party and they're all like stumbling around that, that kind of post ultra walk. And then like a couple of drinks and the music comes on and like, all these runners are like, like break dancing and like doing this mad dancing. That, the Spartathlon's brilliant. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good party one. Yeah. So when you're training for obviously your events, um, I take it your training's normally focused towards the your next event. Is that right? Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, it doesn't really change that much my training. Um, I, I'm, I'm mainly doing the same yeah i'm just and sometimes it's uh it's hard to call it training i'm just i'm just running i'll be if i wasn't training for that event i'll probably be doing the same stuff anyway because so what's what's your average week look like when you're when you're going for your runs or your training yeah like obviously i'm running every day that's a choice of mine not robbie who coaches me now would sometimes prefer me to take a rest uh, like the one rest day but i i prefer not to I, I like to run um and yeah within the week like maybe two two speed sessions or, or what you'd call speed sessions you know like maybe some reps within a like a, a run and and then maybe some tempo stuff like within a longer run sort of thing one longer run in that week and the rest is just kind of you know just kind of jogging around basically recovery uh, type yeah i mean easy I'll, easy I'll, enjoy I'll, yourself yeah exactly that's the way to the time yeah because if you call it recovery it sounds like you're training but um, no. it's not but, recovery it is yeah, totally you are recovering because you're not yeah you're not training but, yeah, but it's easy it's enjoyable yeah it's just jogging it's easy yeah. and it's what you just go out and yeah i think sometimes we get too focused on like calling things shake out runs and recovery runs and they're just runs it's just running it's, yeah. you know what i mean and once you once you call it things like that it's just 
you forget why you're doing it. You're not doing it to shake out. You're doing it because you love running. And yeah, you know what I mean, it's just good for you. Yeah. So obviously, you mentioned slightly off. You mentioned you run every day. Sort of. Obviously, your recent your recent jog uh, the jog. You did you have a rest day after that? Yeah, 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 I did. Yeah, yeah all right. That's that's what I was just I was just gonna check how how hardcore you were there. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not like um, I'm on a streak that sort of thing. I just not like, like me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're on. What's your streak? You're on. Um, I'm four nine five today. Four hundred. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I suppose once you're on that sort of number, then you kind of just yeah you have to keep going. You know what I, mean? I would like, I would I would have tried to crawl a mile if I could off the next day. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> moving, moving yeah, on. So, um, to go back to that, I mean, I did take, yeah, I took about four or five days where I just couldn't, I couldn't have run. It was just as simple as that. It just wasn't, like, there was, a, like, after, like, the second day or something, I did, like, I'd, I'd see someone running past and think, oh, I wonder if I could do that, and I'd try, and I just, yeah, it just, just didn't it just wasn't working but I do try to get back to running after like a longer race like as soon as possible because I yeah. think it helps in recovery like just just to get your body moving again that like movement helps so much and if you if you don't I find if I don't move enough then my recovery comes a bit stagnant do you know what I mean and, and yeah. lingers around a bit longer it's so, something it's something i've learned o over over the last few years that i need to go for a a short run or or jog whatever you want to call it as soon as i can because i one i feel better afterwards two it, i i don't suffer so badly from stiffness and tightness and all that sort of stuff and my motivation ca carries on my head carries on Mm -hmm. um where if i beforehand where i've taken i don't know a week's rest or whatever i end up you know sagging yeah 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 i think it's important i think we're i think one movement is important to us anyway we as human beings we're built to move you know so uh, when we're not moving it's kind of odd for your body but also as runners our body's so conditioned to us moving every single day and as soon as you stop that is quite it is quite a shock to the body it's like someone who's never run all of a sudden like running for like five or six days in a row their body's going to be smashed you know because yeah. their, body's not, their body's not used to it and i think your your body gets used to kind of routine and, and habit and when you change it like abruptly like that it, it, it puts it out of kilter a little bit so but you're right i think sometimes just that just that act, that movement of, of running, even if it's only for 10 or 15 minutes, makes a difference to your recovery. You know? Definitely. So, obviously, that, that brings us on to your recent Le Jog. Now, we, you, know, you, you obviously decided to go uphill, which was harder, um, yeah. from Land's End. So, obviously, big kudos for you for that. You could have gone downhill, but, you know, you stuck with the uphill. Um, <laughs> I tried downhill before, it didn't work. <laughs> Obviously, you first attempted in 2018, um, but it, you ended up not finishing that. Uh, what happened there? Um, uh, and what sort of, how did it feel when you didn't achieve what you set out to achieve? Um, yeah, what happened was, um, I mean, yeah, I physically, I. Um, I started retaining fluids a little bit and well quite a lot and and puffing up like I was um yeah it was ridiculous I was I got to one point where I really couldn't I couldn't see out of my eyes because my eyes were so puffed up but in in hindsight and always say this like I just you know I could blame it on that but the that first time I attempted it I just wasn't I wasn't I wasn't physically in good enough shape to do it because I didn't complete it you know I mean that and that was one of the like it wasn't the fault of me puffing up I just wasn't in good enough shape that's why I started 
puffing up and retaining water, you know. So just wasn't good enough that first time, basically. Um, and and what did it feel like? I mean, at the time, it. I, I mean, I got. I think I got to like the seventh day. I was like a couple of days away. So it was. Although the journey wasn't fulfilled and I didn't get there, I remember at the time it. It, it, it wasn't, I wasn't too disappointed because our little seven day journey from, I think, rather than John O'Groats to Land's End, we went John O'Groats to Bridgewater, which isn't, uh, isn't as famous a route, but um, <laughs> yeah, it, I kind of, it, it was a beautiful journey and I'd met so many lovely people who came out and supported me that I kind of, I just concentrated on how beautiful those seven days were and just didn't really, I didn't really think too much about the fact that I didn't make it. So um, I think as time went on, like a year later, that I think it, I lingered a bit more with me, the fact that I didn't make it. And that's why I decided to, to go back and do it again. But yeah, at the time it was, I was happy for those seven days and not, despondent of the two days that didn't happen you know is that something you've learned from experience then because obviously what? you've not you've not finished every single race in your life you've had dnfs before yeah i think well i think when you're honest as a runner um you it's quite in hindsight dnf is the best best things that ever happened to you as a runner because you can you can learn from them and a lot of the time in a dnf you, you've gone to like a pretty dark place and you might have got out of it a little bit, but then you've ended up doing anything. But you, you really don't learn anything. Like those races that go well, you don't like, you mentioned the Grand Union Canal um, a few years ago and like I got a course record. I didn't learn anything from that at all because everything just kind of went well. Yeah. And you don't really like you don't really remember that much about it because it just it was just smooth so it's only the bad races that you actually learn from as a runner i think you know so you've got to have those dnfs to make sure you you come back like stronger and better next time and like dnf in that first uh le jog or joggle made me yeah made our second attempt like so much easier because we knew what we could do to make it better you know so yeah it's part of the journey dnfs are all part of your journey you know you've got to you've got to love them you've got to embrace them yeah i think i think once you've had one and you know you you sort of know what to expect and you you do you learn from them um my first was in 2012 um and it was horrible it was the worst you feel like you've let people down you let yourself down all that sort of stuff but the next time I DNF'd, I, I learned so much from the first one. I knew how to deal with a DNF. I knew what to take from it. Mm -hmm. Like you're saying, it's a learning experience. And we progress and improve, don't we? Yeah, yeah, totally, man. I mean, I suppose there's always that. It, like you say, I think yeah, the one thing that might linger is you let other people down. You know, like people, like we all know ultra running, like I was saying, it's not that like you need so many other people. Uh, for it to work your, your crew and your that, that give up their time for you to achieve your personal goals and when you when you don't make it i think it's yeah it's hard i think that's the hard thing you think that you've let you've let other people down yeah and and uh, do you know my thing about dnf style like it's never and i'll be quite honest that like, every race i've ever dnf'd it i've i've not been injured sometimes i've blamed it on injury but I've not been injured. It's always I've just haven't been strong enough in my mind. You know, like talk about that in Belfast when I was running and I dropped out of the GB team and I, I was, yeah, it was an injury. But if I was strong, strong enough in the mind that I could have just run through that injury, you know. So, so I think, yeah, every one of my DNFs is just, just mentally not strong enough in that race, you know. I think, I think you, you, you're right there in a way because a lot of the times we're not strong enough in the head during a race and we let our heads talk us out of things, you know, yeah. stuff that we normally could either run through a little pain or a little niggle, you know, we can get to the next checkpoint and sort it out. Instead of that, you're like, no, I'm done. Yeah, yeah, you your know? mind will search for something to, to hook onto 
to then you know to then use that as an excuse for you to stop but yeah I mean, you know, everyone, it's like your mind is so much more powerful than your, than your body. And if you're in a good way, then nothing, nothing can stop you, man. Nothing can stop you. You know, you, if, you, if you're strong enough will to, to make that finish, then you'll get there. But yeah, as soon as you, um, and it's transitory as well, isn't it? Like you're, yeah. you're strong at some points and you're weak at other points. But it, it's if you let that weakness kind of, like seep into you that that's when you're in trouble yeah i mean yeah and it happened and that that brings us into your into your jog as i said you went uphill um the different way to obviously 2018 so automatically you've changed it round so it it felt different must have felt different starting at land's end instead of john o'groats you know you started down towards the tropics instead of up in the in the in the cold scotland And I could understand people as well, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, that, that as well. So your aim was to go as fast as you could and do it in sub-10 days. Is that right? Well, no. Well, my aim wasn't, you know, I suppose. I think the first time round, I tried to go as fast as I could. And I think ultimately, yeah, I wasn't good enough to, to get there going as fast as I could. The second time round, um, I just wanted to beat Richard's, yeah, nine days, 21 hours record and, and yeah, and to try and go that that sub 10 days. And yeah, I mean, I suppose I was going, that is probably as fast as I can go, but it seemed like I was being, the second time around, I was being a little bit more sensible. Yep. You know I mean? and, and I think that was, it wasn't, that wasn't down to me, but that was down to my crew Mick, Charlotte, and, and especially Robbie in, in that logistical side of things. Like, yeah, just talking me into a more sensible mindset. And it, and it, and it worked, yeah. So, obviously, leading up to, you know, leading up to, to the actual attempt, how was your preparation this time now? Yeah, I mean, it was fine, man. Like, we, we did meet, we, oh, we did plan to go in May, but then, um, obviously, that, we weren't... <laughs> like the situation at the time wasn't favorable to us running um kind of through you know the whole country and, and Robbie couldn't come over from Italy and so um it got delayed by a few months but it, yeah it was fine actually I felt really yeah pretty good and pretty decent Nick you know it had been lovely kind of sunny summer hadn't it and and we'd been like everyone had a bit more time on their hands didn't they so yeah. my training had been had been pretty decent actually and and I'd actually been doing like less mileage than I would have done like in years previously so I felt fit but but fresh as well at the same time so yeah I felt like I I felt and that in turn mentally makes you feel obviously a lot more confident as well, doesn't it? So I just, I just felt strong physically and mentally. Obviously you learned from some stuff from the first attempt. Um, and you mentioned your, your crew you had, including um, your coach, Robbie. Um, do you think that made a great, a, a, quite a, a difference having him on a, on a bike uh, alongside you? Yeah, it made a massive difference. Yeah. I mean, there was a, there was a couple of things that, I think made made a big big difference. So, so one, well, in fact, they're kind of entwined together. So, and I'd always like, I know Robbie's my coach, but he's also he's like a, he's just a good, he's a really good friend before he's my coach as well. So it's not like it's not like Robbie's there as a coach, kind of shouting numbers at me, and um, it, like he it's it's really he's he's there more as a friend as well. You know, just happens to be my coach, but I think. My the one thing I wanted to change from the last time round was I realised that I'd spent like when you run an ultra race and you want to do well in it, you don't mess around in checkpoints, you know. So it's one of the first things you learn when you're running ultras because they're so they're so easy to lose so much time in checkpoints. So you know, one of the first things I learned was just don't stop in them, just carry on going, like wave at people and say thank you. But like you have to be like if you want to finish like in a fast time, you can't, yeah, you can't stop in them. So I kind of took that into the second joggle attempt and I was like, I just don't want to, I don't want to stop. Because once you stop, it's really, you know, for lunch or you, or you have a power nap or something, it's, you start to lose so much time. So 
that was my decision. I just want relentless forward motion. And, and yeah, to start running at the, at the start of the day and just to keep moving until I finish. And the fact that Robbie was there on the bike enabled me to be able to do that a lot better because Robbie was just there with drinks, um, sometimes a little bit of food. So, so it just meant that I could keep moving the, the whole yeah. time. And, and that in turn, that the knock-on effect of that just meant that I'd finished so much earlier in the, in the evening which then meant I had so much more time to recover before the next day. So it just, it was just sweet. It just went well, you know, in that aspect. Yeah. I mean, you do lose a lot of time when you have to stop to take in food or, or drink with, you know, change your bottles or what have you else. So having someone alongside you all the way, able to go ahead, get you another bottle if needs be, get you something to eat on to keep you going it obviously saves you so much time. Yeah, it does. And they're just so well drilled. I mean, Mick and uh, Charlotte as well. So I was, I was taking real food for Mick and Mick and Charlotte when, when we met them. And Robbie would just have my, like, like kind of fuel on, in liquid form that I'd drink, you know, did, did, like, energy drinks and stuff. So, yeah, it, it, it obviously, yeah, it just makes a, it makes a big difference. And I think for me, that kind of, some people it works for to stop and to you know put their feet up for a little bit and then get going again but for me it doesn't i just need to it just makes me hurt more if i keep moving it doesn't hurt as much but if i stop and start i i, I it hurts more <laughs> um so what was the hardest part of the journey for you from land's end to johnny Groats? that you know what in your head which was the part that went, that that was fucking hard. I, I, yeah. Well, we're allowed to swear on this podcast. Yeah, you can swear, mate. Don't be out of the start. Yeah. <laughs> Been really good. <laughs> um, I'll, try to, I'll try to keep it up, the clean version. <laughs> um, I, I was really lucky, actually, man. Like, I, from the moment I woke up on the first day at Land's End, I had this, I just had this feeling that everything's going to be all right and I'll feel... I feel strong and uh, yeah, and it just felt right. Everything felt aligned, you know, that it was the perfect time to do it with the perfect people and, and it was just going to go smoothly. And I had that feeling every single day, apart from the last, uh, the penultimate day around like Inverness um, in, in that afternoon. And it was weird because I just, all of a sudden, it's almost like I wasn't panicking in my head, but I just, all of a sudden, I kind of questioned my own mortality a little bit. That I didn't, like, I couldn't see myself finishing for that whole afternoon and evening. I was like, oh my God, this is, it's all falling to bits. It's not going to work out. I can't, I don't think I can do it now. And it was just, it was like a, yeah, maybe like eight hours of that which then in turn has a knock-on effect to your running and it means I'm not stop starting. And it was, it was the only time in the, in pretty much apart from one little blip on the third day, right at the end of the third day where I didn't keep that relentless forward motion and I was stopping and trying to sleep and then getting up again and, and trying for another hour or so, and then maybe I'm another sleep. So yeah, I was lucky. It was only, one afternoon in the whole kind of like nine almost 10 days where I where it got you know grim it was hard most of the time but it just got grim on that afternoon how did, how did you deal with that afternoon then how what because obviously having those demons in your head and I've experienced them when you just think oh I can't do this I, I'm it's not going to happen how did you get over that hurdle to to finally get back uh, into stride I don't know. There was a. I was lucky enough to be running with James Stewart at the time. James Stewart's another GB uh, 24 hour athlete, and he was around. A very experienced man, and also very experienced. Like James is amazing at kind of, like I've seen him in a few 24 hour races when you think he's just completely down and out, and he kind of rises like a phoenix. Do you know what I mean? He's amazing like that, and he had some like words of wisdom for me, which helped, which kind of. Yeah, just stuck in my mind. And, and also, I think what, a bit going back to a bit what we talked about earlier, like when I 
DNF'd the first joggle, I I was quite like I say, I didn't really it didn't bother me as much. I had a nice time, but my crew, like Mick and Charlotte, who were around, and Richard as well, who was around to help. My only thing was I I felt I'd let them down a little bit. So this time round, when I got to those dark places, it was really it was the fact that those three were there again helping me that drove me on because I just couldn't and just didn't want to. It just let them down again. Yeah. So it was it was almost like it was more like an extrinsic motivation that that pulled me through the kind of intrinsic the that things I was going on with. So yeah, well, I just had I had to do it for them. If they weren't around, I'd probably have stopped and gone on. <laughs> I mean, but, how how often? I mean, you have you obviously got a, a well trained crew there uh, in Charlotte and what have you. I'm I'm the same with my wife. How often does your other half have to give you a bit of tough love on the course? Yeah, she's well, she's good. She's got better. Yeah, like like I mean when you first get into ultras people don't like to see you in pain and then it gets to, then they start to realize that that's part of it and you've got to, if you're not in pain and you're not trying hard enough sort of thing so I don't think they didn't need to there wasn't I don't think it ever got to the point where I needed like tough love I think I think if I'd gone on like that for another like eight hours and they would have needed to start like you know like telling me to like sort it out but yeah. I think I've always had enough of a buffer that you know it was, it was okay and the next day like the last day I was just I was all right again so it was fine it kind of in it we kind of all knew I don't think they were worried about me on the last day that I'd make it and I I kind of had total belief that I'd make it as well so yeah I don't think they really needed to and and I think like me and Robbie talked about this at another time. I'm really bad at um, it, it, like when people telling me what to do, yeah. I do. I do the other thing. I don't like it. Don't like yeah. doing what people tell me to do. So I, it would be interesting to see how they they would have done it. They'd have got me there, but it would have been interesting to see what their plan would have been. Because just saying to me, right, well, you've got to get out there and you've got to do this would make me want to do the opposite. Because uh. <laughs> uh, I remember I was I, I did the classic quarter in 2016. You, you, you know that part of the world. Yeah, yeah, down, yeah. Down, yeah. down Lizard. And uh, I got halfway and I was suffering from heat exhaustion. I collapsed halfway. And I remember my wife coming up to me and said, I didn't come all this fucking way for you to quit. Get up, go. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and off I went. You know, yeah. but if she, if we had just started as a crew, I remember from the first time she would have just pampered me and would yeah. have let me quit. Yeah. So where, you know, you, where you were saying that your, your, your crew got to know how you work, it was the same now for, for my wife. She knows when to give me tough love and when not to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. But the crew I've got, I'm so lucky. Yeah. I mean, basically, so the crew I've got, is Robbie, my friend and coach, who's a vastly experienced ultra runner. He's, you know, he's oh. he has a CV. If you're saying mine's long, his his is <laughs> like longer. And that GB athlete. Then I have Charlotte, who's crewed me like all over the world, and that like, completely knows me. And now is also part of the crew for the GB ultra team as well. And then Mick, who's like the crew what do you call him, that crew head or something yeah. of the GB Ultra team. And then Richard Brown, who was whose record I was trying to beat, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Who's, who, who's run almost 200, over 100 mile races. So they, they knew their stuff there. Yeah. Like um, I was probably the least experienced out of all of them there. So yeah, they, yeah, they were, I was in good hands. Yeah. And well, you even had some, uh, some awesome runners come out with you, Damien Hall. He joined well, I, you. Yeah, yeah. I, had, I had some amazing runners come out. Yeah, there was some, yeah, Damien, Charlie Harper, Nathan yeah. Mayhew, James Stewart, Jim Mann, um, uh, Paul Tierney. Uh, I can't remember, like some real, yeah, it was that who's who of... Uh, yeah. Well, you, you were just you were just pulling them out of the woodwork. It was, 
phenomenal yeah. watching it on Facebook. Yeah, it was it was nice, and and as well as that, it just yeah. I mean, I always go and like, I can't thank people enough. Like all those people that came out and, and ran with me, whether it was for like two hundred meters or like eighty miles, you know, it's like it really is one big team effort. That that, that sort of run, like it, my crew are important, but yeah, the runners that come out as well are as important. Like I still. I steal their energy, you know, and I use it for my own benefit to get me to the end. So I am really am indebted and grateful to everyone who, who came and supported uh, both times. You know? So you, 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 you finished it uh, in nine days, 21 hours, 14 minutes and two seconds. Two seconds, yeah. quite important in our game. Um, yeah. Unbelievable, mate. I, and obviously I'm, I'm very proud of you. Um, as pretty much most of the UK ultra running world is, mate. Um, you you set out to do something and you achieved it. You know, you failed the first time. You didn't let it get you down, as we've already talked. But you went back and decided to go finish it. How does it feel now? You've now that that dust has settled, and you know you've recovered and everything else. You're back running. How does it feel knowing what you've achieved today? Yes, yes, it's nice. Uh, I don't know, I don't really know how to answer. I mean, it's not, um, again, and I say it again, and maybe it's just a real naff answer, but it's, yeah, it's nice, just nice memories, man. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, it's, it's just nice to look back on it. And sometimes, it's, yeah. When it's a good a, story for your grandkid, isn't it? Yeah, just to drift off, and I just, it's just like a good feeling all round, you know, because it was just, uh, I, I know it sounds stupid, like, when I say it, and, like, but it, now, like, it's, like, four weeks on, and, like, the memory is just, it's just, like, a good, like, a good couple of weeks away with some real nice people, you know, and, and, um, because you forget the kind of pain and the toughness, and you just remember, yeah, you remember the good bits, so it was, like, a, it was, like, a nice, but a little bit tough, like tour of tour of Great Britain that ended how we wanted it to end. I don't know. So it's just yeah, it's just real nice memories, you know. Some some more beautiful running memories. Uh, I've, I've been lucky. What was your what was your favourite part to run through? My favourite part, what of the of the yeah of the of of the of that route. Oh man, I tell you what, it's not even. There was one morning and I can't, I had a real nice, I can't, I think we were running out of Ludlow. I think it must've been that day. And it was kind of, I seem to remember it was going to be a warm day. It was kind of that, that misty morning. And, and the road we were running on was actually closed off. It was shut. And so it was kind of, we were just running on this A road with no cars at all. It was, it was quite nice. And there was, um, I was Richard Brown was on the bike behind me, and Richard's such a wonderful person to like to like be up beside you on the bike because he just points out everything that's that's beautiful in the world and oh listen to the listen to the sound of the buzzard and look at the wonderful uh, like Latin name of a tree over there and he like he really is and there was a chap called Max who who'd come out and run, he was running about four hours with us. And, and there we, we went past a field and it was like a field connected to like about five or six other fields. And this herd of cows in the field just ran with us for about five or six fields at exactly at our pace. And I don't, it was just, a, <laughs> it was just a, for me, it was just a beautiful moment. And <laughs> I don't know, it was, a, I, I remember that as, as, it was just a real nice feeling yeah, to be running with, Richard and Max and about 70 cows as well. It was nice, yeah. So, moving on, um, you now run your own, own own business and what have you, called Rerun. Mm. We, we've got to talk about it. We can't let you come on in and not talk about uh, the wonderful work you're doing. For those that don't know, can you explain what Rerun is and uh, how it came about? Yeah, well, I I wouldn't describe it as a business. That I, it's more of a social enterprise. Not even that, like a like a it, maybe we're like an environmental campaigning uh, 
community company. That, actually, maybe it's better to call it a business. A bit of a mouth. But, um, but that based within the within the running community. Um, we're 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 just trying to make runners aware of the fact that there is uh, a kind of like scar left on the earth from from running. You know, I think. We're, it's so easy for us to think that running is such a simple sport and because we spend so much time kind of outdoors in nature that we're like we're not causing you know any strife to the environment you know like like other sports or not even just businesses or or, or whatever so we we just like to highlight the fact that there are practices within the running industry that aren't that great and and could be changed and and could be changed to make running that more environmental such as you know the the excessive consumption and of 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 kit and like these like how we're sold by these big brands their marketing um departments that we we need this bit of kit and our trainers are only last this long so we need to change them every I don't know, two or three months, and and our and the kit that we use in running is like it's it's really not good, you know. It's it's basically it's plastic, it's petro it's petroleum based, it's made by mining fossil fuels, you know. It's um, so there's a, there's a lot of running that's that's not that that's not that great, you know. And and also like all the big events that get put on and, and the kind of waste that's created by those big events, you know like with the with the water with their goodie bags with their t-shirts so we we just try and yeah just make runners aware that we can all do a little bit to make running a, a, a you know a, a bit more environmentally friendly and i think as well that we as runners we we have a kind of like we spend so much time out in the nature and and on those beautiful trails that we're kind of we should be like guardians of those trails and we should try to make a bit of a difference so to enable like you know my granddaughter when she runs to be able to run in those trails as well so yeah that's a bit of a mouthful isn't it <laughs> you must have seen uh, already from when you first started to now a big difference in the mindset of runners slowly going towards the way you'd like them to start thinking yes right i mean one of our first our first kind of not a battle but our first kind of campaigns and it's still running on is that i mean we noticed that we so basically we collect unwanted running kit to help rerun you know uh keep going we take unwanted running kit and then we sell it like in the charity shop and that money goes to help uh like some of the projects we we run and some of the campaigning we do and what we saw was um like 70 percent of all of the like stuff we were getting that people didn't want was race t-shirts so our first kind of battle was to try and try and get to runners and then race organizers and just to stop this habitual um thing of just feeling like if you if you go for a run you need to get a free t-shirt because it's just it's it's so much waste and and uh and it's not the type of it's not compostable waste it's plastic it's microfibers it's you know it's it, the manufacture of the t-shirt is comes from fossil fuels so so yeah that was our first kind of battle and and that, this was like two and a half years ago i think we started rerun maybe three years ago and there, there has been a change it's not perfect but yeah definitely the tide is turning you've got you've got um initiatives like Jim Mann's um, uh, Tees Not, no, I always get this the wrong way around, Trees trees Not Tees, where he's now getting a lot of marathon organisers and uh, like big city run organisers to, to give an option so people can plant a tree rather than take a t-shirt and you have lots more um, organisers having that opt out so you can say I don't want a t-shirt. So it is changing, it's definitely changing, yeah. You know, I, 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 and I'm one of those people that you have uh, sort of changed the mindset of. I, I've donated a lot of my old race 
t-shirts and shoes to to you about a year or two ago actually when you're not long started big boxes of it and the only t-shirts i've kept are the ones that were special so my first london marathon t-shirt which is cotton because i could wear it every day i don't like wearing tech t-shirts on the daytime because it doesn't feel right um so i've turned down t-shirts at races you know when they've offered them um so i'm one of the people that you have changed mindsets you know I, i've still got a lot of work to do but we're you know if it makes a little bit of difference then we're getting there surely yeah we are getting there yeah and and also we see the big brands as well who are starting to to do and think in the right way as well like like they're getting there i've seen a couple of uh recently in the last like couple of weeks like salomon who are who are using or trying to do a sort of closed loop they're turning ski boots into or old ski boots into some of the material they're going to use for their trainers and you've got on running who are who are trying to make a completely closed loop recyclable shoe so that you were starting to get there i think some of the companies are it's not perfect yet some of the brands but we're definitely moving in the right in the right direction yeah because it's unsustainable our consumption of running gear and kit it's it's unsustainable there's just too much of it and we're and it doesn't it doesn't go anywhere it doesn't dig you know it's just ending up in landfill and seeping you know the all of the chemicals and the plastic that go into it just seeps out into into the earth basically um but yeah it, it's getting there we are yeah i feel positive you know that we we will we will get somewhere yeah things are changing and if, and I, if people wanted to donate some some of their old kit to you that they no longer need the race t-shirts that are hanging about in the bottom of the drawer how can they do that uh yeah like we've got we're on our website which is reruncloving.org there's a there's there's a list of all that drop off different drop off drop off points where they can go to take uh, stuff that local to them which then gets sent to us but if they, if if people there's a few things that that we're we're always happy to take people's donations and stuff but but what we're about in rerun is is like not consuming and and like making your stuff last longer so like there's a few things is like if people want to help out with rerun the first thing is to take a look at the kit you've got already and like kind of work out whether you do actually need to buy anything more or whether you do need to get rid of anything like can you just keep what you've got and not not buy anything else you know because what we don't want to do is people to give us old stuff and then go out and buy new stuff because that kind of defeats what we're what we're yeah. trying to do so um yeah so people can donate to us yeah you people can buy from us as well which we try to make all the stuff really affordable and it's so for people who can't uh, don't have the financial you know means to, to buy expensive like brand new sports uh, running stuff they can buy it off our website and it's a lot cheaper and then also it's a good time maybe to um uh to plug as well we have one of our um initiatives i suppose you could call it is we have what we call a shoe bank so we get donations like the better donations some of the ones we get from brands and running shops and also trainers that haven't really been used by people we put on our shoe bank and that's a completely free um like if it's basically supposed to be like a food bank so if anyone knows anyone who can't afford running gear who wants to go out running then they can visit the shoe bank side of our uh website as well and they just all you got to do is email us and that like, tell us you know give us a little tell us a little bit about yourself why why you might not be able to afford uh stuff and we can give them the code for the shoe bank which means they can basically shop for like decent trainers and we'll send them out for nothing as well so um yes yeah, so if anyone knows anyone who who would benefit from that then let us know as well that's really that's really good to know okay we're going to finish with some 10 quick fire questions mate all right what, what are we doing like pop geography <laughs> well it's still sort of running related um well, about west ham i'll do all right yeah. <laughs> okay no maths question, question number one which do you prefer road or trail trail you do a lot of road so i had to ask it um yeah, I'm just okay there. 
Oh, he's done better. Oh, he's quick fire. Yeah, go on. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> okay, do you prefer to run with a vest on or vest off? Vest off, man. Yeah, I thought you would. Um, <laughs> which is your favourite, Brighton or, or Goa? Oh, it's got to be Goa, no? Sunshine, guaranteed sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lovely place. I've been there. <laughs> favourite ever race? Oh, can I... <laughs> People ask me this all the time. I don't know. It's um, can I answer it really airy fairy? Yes, of course. My favourite race is the Journey of Life. Yeah, and nice. that's what I'm on. Yeah. All the ones you've been in, you've loved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Which do you prefer, a point-to-point -point race or a timed event? Point-to-point, -point, man. It's got yeah, it's much better. There's a flow to it. Yeah, an energy to it. Yeah. Do you think pineapple should be on a pizza? Yes or no? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, yeah. Your favourite meal after your favourite meal after a run? Oh, I can't eat. I can never eat anything after a run. I'm terrible. Um, mushroom. I love mushrooms. Yeah. Anything with mushrooms, mushrooms in it? Mushroom. Okay. Um, Just a mushroom, a raw mushroom. <laughs> Maybe with a little bit of uh, with the stalk pulled out and a little bit of hummus uh, nestled into that little uh, that little bowl it, it makes on its own. Yeah. Nice. Delicious. Um, do you do you drink? If so, what's your favourite tipple? I don't drink, no. Kombucha. 0.5% <laughs> and it's enough to get me uh, going, yeah. So are you a coffee and tea drinker then? No, only when it's needed late on in an ultra do I drink coffee. Yeah. Right. Cornwall, then, which is your favourite, Cornwall or Devon? I don't, <laughs> wouldn't be able to tell you which one is which. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and your favourite bit of kit that you always have to take with you on a race? Nothing. <laughs> no, but I don't mean that. There's no the you kit. I really, it's not important to me. Kit. Yeah. I didn't know uh, whether you had a lucky buff or something. <laughs> no, I don't. No, it's um, no. There's nothing. I really don't. You put me in anything, and I'll run. Yeah. It's not. Uh, there's nothing that. But that kind of. I've. I've learned that as well with rerun you know like it's just it's not yeah there's there's nothing there that's that's that important yeah the, no, it's, the, it's true you uh you're not scared of wearing other people's underpants are you mate no no or anything yeah the best, <laughs> the best bit of kit is just a uh, like a happy mind yeah and that's what you need yeah and then everything's easy all right um that's the 10 quick fire uh fire questions done but finally, is there any advice you've got for any beginner runners that have taken up over lockdown running? Um, yeah, the, it, running's hard for everyone. I think some people look at other, I don't know, they look at people who've been running for a long time and think that, oh, like, it just looks, it looks easy for them, it looks effortless, but everyone has those thoughts. And if you're, even if you're going out for like a, if you're like a seasoned ultra runner and you're just going out for a 10k run, at some point in that run, your mind will tell you to stop. Yeah, it's like it's 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 not a struggle, but there's always that that thought in your everyone's mind who's running. You know, it's a natural thing. Your mind tries to tries to stop you expending too much energy. So so don't feel like you're the only one that um, is out there in your mind saying this is too hard. Stop. 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 Nice. Um, if people want to follow you, mate, how can they how can they look out, out for you in your future endeavours? Um, I don't know. Plug <laughs> everything, mate. I don't. Well, I, I'm not great on social media. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, just. Uh, That's right. I'll I'll chuck the links in the description for people, so yeah. that'll, 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 that'll help you out there. Expect a lot. Don't expect like. <laughs> Instagram stories and uh, I yeah I post when I race and that's about it yeah I think that's 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 the bit that everyone wants to follow anyway isn't it <laughs> all right uh, thanks for that mate absolutely brilliant I'm gonna pause the recording and we'll have our finished chat afterwards but thank Pleasure. you for coming on the show uh, absolutely love catching up with you yeah and you man yeah yeah all right so that was the one and only Dan Lawson, such a down to earth human being and a really good mate of mine. He's taught me so much over the years about running.
just by following him, watching what he does and the way, way he acts. And I think we can all learn from the likes of Dan. Anyway, I've dropped his links into the description, so go check him out. I uh, hope you enjoyed listening and watching. Um, if you did, drop us a like, share us, get us out there, spread the love, subscribe, and all the other good things that you can do to help If My Feet Could Talk. Thanks for listening and watching If My Feet Could Talk. I'm the Ultra Running Matlow. Until next time, love you all.